example of your analyte is sodium in solution it is an ion Na plus some now we have it has to go through the process of being changed into an sodium vapor sodium atoms in gaseous form before you can go through and measure the absorption or emission so the process where uh, analyte in solution is converted or any form of sample is converted into the vapor is known as atomization so from the word atom atomization converting to atomic vapor and the um, component or we say device or component that does the atomization is an atomizer okay and we will see in atomic absorption we will use two kinds of atomizer one using a flame flame means something is going to be you know uh, a hydrocarbon is going to be oxidized with oxygen and becoming co2 so we're going to have a flame and we will see that that flame will be the source of heat which uh, source of energy which will convert the um, solution into uh, ultimately into an atomic vapor or we have another thing that we will be looking at which doesn't use a flame but uses electrical energy uh, to do the uh, to at atomize the sample as I've said, some of these things we, it will be a repetition but it's an important introduction to when we get into atomic absorption. Okay? We talk about atomic spectra, we have to look at the energy level diagrams to understand uh, the absorption, emission and the, also the fluorescence process involving atoms. As we know or as we have seen, the unique... Uh, uh, it's it's comprised of um, unique energy levels okay and it's these transitions between of the electrons between these different levels that give rise to uh, the spectra we've seen this twice before energy level like diagrams for sodium and this one for magnesium plus and so when you talk about atomic absorption atomic emission it's the atoms in the outer veins like outer uh, valence electrons that are involved in the jumping to the higher energy states okay so for for sodium it's, it's the 3s orbital that's involved in the uh, electronic transition similarly for the mg uh, for magnesium plus and it becomes of course more complicated if you have an atom with two valence electrons uh, such as example given here is what is this? Huh? Magnesium. Oh, okay. This is the 3s orbital for if it's magnesium, you have two electrons in the 3s orbital. So that two electrons can be involved in. Um, transitions which will produce a, a spectra more com which, which, which is more complex how can you understand that you know there are more lines lines in which uh, which show the transition involved involving the electrons this concept of a singlet or a, a triplet excited state is more important when we are going to be talking about fluorescence you know molecular fluorescence but anyway, as an introduction, uh, so that we understand, I don't know whether you've had it in your physical chem already or inorganic, where we talk, where we look at here the three s, the two electrons in the three s orbital, for example, of magnesium. Okay, this is the outer valence electron. Two in the three s orbital. So in the ground state, <coughs> the two orbitals are uh, match. Their spins are match not match uh, opposite opposite spins so you have a uh, plus plus and a negative okay so um, that is what and that ground state is called a singlet state 
where the electron spins are opposed to one another so if you take this as plus and this is minus when you add the two spins it's zero that's why you have a singlet state is it's the addition of the spins plus one so plus half minus half for example is zero zero plus one you get one so it's that's why it's called a singlet ground state now if one of those electrons are going to be uh, are going to undergo a transition to a, a higher energy level for example into the 3p orbital there's one of two states that it can be um, th that it can exist as one is the called the singlet excited state where the electron under went up to a higher energy state Okay, it was excited to an, a higher energy level but the spin did not change so if it was uh, downwards in the 3p orbital it's still downwards so if we were to again sum up the spins it'll be still plus half minus half plus one it'll be still one that's why it's singlet okay now so it's called a singlet excited state excited because one of the electrons has gone to a high energy level increase in energy of the whole system compared to the ground state the triplet excited state is when that electron not only goes to a, a higher energy level it absorbs energy goes to a higher energy level so it's an excited state now and also the spins has uh, changed okay so we see now that the electron in the ground state and the one in the uh, excited 3p level have spins parallel to one another so if we were to again add up the thing add up this spin and this spin plus half plus half is one one plus one or rather i think it's two s plus one sorry the the formula have you done this at all singlet triplet no never mind Okay, just remember that okay it's 2s plus 1 just now I said s plus 1 so half plus half is 1 1 times 2 is 2 2 plus 1 is 3 so you get a triplet state triplet excited state and you know if it's triplet there must be parallel spins if it's a uh, sing, uh, singlet it must be opposing spins you're talking about two electrons that came from one orbital okay so this is just to understand the, the singlet and the triplet state which I say will be important when we are talking about fluorescence and transitions if we look at those lines again here it's not it's all uh, uh, if you try to draw lines between the ground state level and the upper energy levels okay it's not that you see lines from all possible lines 3s 5s 3s 5p you know you don't see all lines because what is shown is only the uh, allowed transitions transition means jumping from a lower energy level to a higher energy level only certain transitions are allowed so the ones that you don't see the lines from 3s to 5p for example are forbidden transitions which do not occur so you talk about these, trans these lines, uh, associated with them are probability. The probability of the electron jumping from here to here is a certain probability. The higher the probability, the darker the line because it will happen more often. It's not, you know, I mean, in a, in a sample, it's not only one atom that's going to, you know, it's not only one electron that's going to be jumping up to a high energy level. It's a lot of atoms and a lot of electrons are involved. So you talk about probability. So if there's a line yes the probability of it of that transition happening is high no such line it's a forbidden transition it won't happen low very low probability okay so we talk about transitions which are forbidden for example 3s to 3p uh, and and so on to 4s this transition will occur but directly from 3s to 4s is a forbidden transition it will not occur so and how do we do know that experimentally when we measure the absorption wavelength because all those lines refer to a certain characteristic wavelength so how do we know that you know in, exper in experimentally how do we know that you know oh, 
all these things occur that some things are forbidden some things are allowed because you don't see them the forbidden lines you don't you cannot detect the wavelengths you only detect certain wavelengths so if you were to calculate the energy from 3s to 4s it should correspond to a certain wavelength right because that jump is a certain energy so it's a certain wavelength but you in uh, in uh, in the experiment using the instrument you do not detect such a line so you know that such a transition does not occur or is as a forbidden transition so nature has rules only certain things will happen certain things will not and again you talk about forbidden you talk about probability okay probability of uh, of transitions happening so absorption is just now we're talking about absorption from the ground state you jump to the higher energy level to to become a, to exist in an excited state uh, where you have in, uh, in, you have absorbed energy when you talk about mission it's now the other way around from the excited state so of course before the before you can get any emission the atoms must be excited must get into an excited state the electrons must jump to a high energy level then when it comes down release energy in the form of light then only you get emission if it's released in the form of heat you don't get any atomic emission spectra okay. another term you talk about resonance and non-resonance lines when you talk about lines you talk about you know either absorption or emission you know those blue lines and in those energy light level diagrams resonance involves the ground state so if you talk about jumping from the higher excite energy excited state to the ground state which involves uh, it, the lower level is the ground state so that's a resonance line however uh, on the other hand when you what you term as non-resonance is now here's another term that you want to understand relaxation okay relax in the relaxed state means high any energy level goes down to a lower energy level so that's called relaxation where the atom undergoes relaxation releases energy goes down to a lower energy level more stable okay so you talk about stability you talk about relaxation you talk about um, you know excitation transitions all these things should when mentioned you should understand these words okay so relaxation from an excited state to another excited state for example the if you have now remember in the sodium the ground state the electron is in what orbital for sodium outer valence electron is in 3s okay so the ground state the electron must be in 3s so let's say it absorbs some energy from 3s it went to 3p and then it went to 4s so now the electron in the 4s if it relaxes to the 3p and gives out some light that light is that uh, that wavelength emission wavelength is called a non-resonance line why it jumped from 4s to 3p and you detect the emission uh, involving that transition so 4s to 3p 3p is still not the ground state so it's a non-resonance line however the 3p goes down to the 3s that's a resonance line for that particular atom usually resonance line uh, are more intense the absorption or the emission is more is higher okay usually atomic absorption okay this is okay so now we want to uh, back up again okay we talk about atomic absorption absorption lower energy level jumping to a high, higher energy level if we were to look at the uh, energy level diagrams again if you look at your diagram 3s to 3p it's only one line 3s to the other p orbital because there's two okay uh, two lines it should be just one energy one number and so the spectrum atomic absorption spectrum should be theoretically just a single line uh, what is it for sodium i'm sorry it's shown in your diagram five what is it 
give me the two lines for sodium the jump from 3s to 3p what is it the two absorption wavelengths involving uh, the two resonant lines 3s to 3p what is it one of them 589.6 those is an angstrom huh? and the other one is 589.0 nanometers okay so you should if you were to visualize what an atomic absorption spectra spectra means when you talk about spectra spectra is uh, many many okay or you talk about spectrum one spectrum you talk about um, energy being absorbed or maybe you want to talk about emission you either show absorption lines or emission lines versus wavelength okay so in this case what you should see is lines which have specific uh, wavelengths okay however we find that um, last time when we were, when we were discussing the instrument we said that the slit width because of the slit width you have an effective bandwidth so you never have a line but actually you have like a a line with an effective bandwidth because of the slit okay but now we want to back up and say that even if it's not because of the slit width or because of the monochromator um, there are other sources that give these atomic lines a natural width which you cannot narrow anymore narrow down anymore they have a specific a natural width and you call that um, where these lines are now no longer lines and they have a certain width uh, you call them you call that phenomena line broadening okay the line is now broadened so what are the sources of line broadening which makes these uh, atomic lines have a finite width finite means a certain width infinite means until infinity okay so these lines theoretically should be just a single line no width zero width but it has a finite width so the line is broadened due to three effects shown here which um, which you cannot overcome naturally as it is you you have the uncertainty effect the doppler effect or the or pressure broadening which causes the line to um, to broaden okay to have a certain width now what is the uncertainty principle again have you done that in 131 okay it's now the important here to thing to remember about uncertainty principle is not so much the definition or you i want you to do calculations involving a certain principle but for you to remember in, in with relation to what we're doing is this is one of the reasons why the line has a natural width a natural uh, the atomic spectra line spectral lines has a finite width okay it's not zero it's related to the lifetime of the transition states okay um, transition state means uh, the the atom is in a certain condition which is temporary for example the electron now gets excited jumps to a higher energy level so you get an excited state so that excited state is an example of a transition state it's not going to last it's not going to exist forever it's not going to be in it in that excited state and it the electron is not going to be in that high, higher energy level forever and ever ever okay till till whenever till the world ends no it's a transition state it has a certain lifetime a very short lifetime where that electron will then want to become more stable it will go, go down it will lose that extra energy and go down to the ground state so this one you must be clear okay these excited states are not going to last forever they have a certain lifetime 
so with relation to that, the uncertainty principle which says that the uncertainty in the frequency times the lifetime of the excited state is greater than 1. So what we get is uh, usually the, these lifetimes of these excited states are between 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 8. I mean very short. Okay? It's not even one second. Very short lifetimes. Which will then, because they have a finite lifetime, which will make these lines have a natural line width of about 10 to the minus 4 angstrom. I don't know, I don't have the figure for this. I don't have the symbol, correct symbol here. Okay? It's not A, it's angstrom. A with a knot on top, which is 10 to the minus, minus 5 nanometers. So, due to the uncertainty principle, the natural line width will, have, will be about 10 to the minus 5. Now we add on the other two, two effects. The second one is the Doppler effect. To show that, what is the Doppler effect? Okay, you have your detector, which will now see the radiation coming towards it, okay? So, and this radiation is going to come from a certain atomic species. So, depending on whether that um, species is moving towards the detector or away from the detector, it will it will influence the uh, the wavelength. So the wavelength of radiation seen by the detector will decrease if the motion is towards the detector. Transducer here means the detector. Okay. If it's moving um, away from the transducer, the rate, uh, the wavelength will be higher. So due to its movement, whether it's towards or away from the de detector, the wavelength that the detector detects is going to be different. Hence, you get that, that finite line width. So it's not only one wavelength. And in the flame, where we will talk about uh, in, in atomic absorption, the atoms will be formed in the flame. So in the flame where you have higher, more energy, more, more, more energy given to the uh, atoms moving here and there, you get that the line widths are now two orders of magnitude higher than the natural line width. What do you understand by two orders of magnitude? One order magnitude means times what? Times one? One order magnitude is 10. So if you say one order of magnitude higher will be 10 times more. Two orders of magnitude will be 100 times, 10 to the square to the power of 2. Okay? Three orders of magnitude will be 10 to the power of 3, 1,000 times. So now due to this Doppler effect, the line width is further increased. Just now we said due to the uncertainty principle, you have a line width, a natural line width of 10 to the minus 5. You know, that this line has a width of 10 to the minus 5. Due to the Doppler effect, you have two orders of magnitude, which means that 100 times more. 10 to the minus 5 times 100, 10 to the minus 3, wider. 10 to the minus 5 is small, okay? Times 100 becomes 10 to the minus 3, even wider. And the third e effect uh, which causes broadening of these atomic lines is called pr uh, is pressure broadening. So when we get collisions, there are many, like I said, in a certain sample, you're going to have many, many atoms, many ions, whatever formed, okay? And these will undergo collisions between each other, especially when you have it in a heated medium where the kinetic energy of these species are higher. So they will be colliding with one another. And because of this collision between these species, again, this increases the line width by two or three orders of magnitude. Okay, either 100 times or 1,000 times more than the natural line width which was due to the uncertainty principle. So these are three, three um, causes of line broadening where this is unavoidable. Okay, you have your natural line width. 
Now the Doppler effect and the pressure broadening, of course, it will depend on the medium. Maybe the more kinetic energy, more collisions, greater, uh, greater broadening due to uh, this third effect. And, the, and then you have your Doppler effect. Um, okay. So that we were talking about your line widths of your atomic spectrum whether it be atomic absorption spectrum or atomic emission another term that we must be familiar with is again we've mentioned this before we're talking about band or continuum spectrum here what is shown is a spectrum of again remember when we mention spectrum it must be how something varies with respect to wavelength so the bottom here is wavelength here either you can see it as absorption or emission okay the difference is emission is this is light intensity okay intensity of light which changes absorption means it is a remember a is related to log po over p so what we want to show here is um, the barium line one of the barium let's say we talk about emission lines barium emission line is at 553.6 nanometers um, if in that same sample with we uh, uh, there was calcium calcium can form hydroxides you're not talking about precipitate, nah? CaOH2, no. Here you're talking about CaOH as an atomic species. So, this, this species, CaOH, will, is not an atomic species, it's a molecular species. That means, if you were to measure its atomic emission of this molecular species, it will be a band. Remember, why is it uh, for a molecular species, it's a band and not a line? Here. Remember, if it's a molecule, what can happen in a molecule that cannot happen in an atom? What's the word? What's the magic word? Vibration. And drawing the spectrum should come very naturally to you. If it's an atom, it's only one line. Ground state, excited state single lines no vibrational levels molecule we talk about vibrational levels okay so when you when it goes up here more than one line many many lines close to one another cannot be distinguished by by even the best monochromator you cannot distinguish between these lines so it appears as a band but here it's a single line but remember that line just now we said it has a finite width also we just talk about you know the atom the atomic absorption also has a finite width but the band is even wider okay so here you have your barium absorption line because we didn't show it with any width we're just talking about the line compared to a absorption or emission for a calcium uh, caoh species so in this case if in your sample you had calcium and that calcium forms caoh and now you want to measure you are interested in barium so you want to measure the absorption for barium at 553.6 so your monochromator you set it at 553.6 nanometers hoping to to measure the uh, emission of barium but what we find is in that sample you also get caoh being formed and it also gives out light at the same at the same wavelength although you know at other wavelengths it also gives out light but when when the detector is set here it not only measures barium emission it also measures the emission for caoh so in that case we talk about the caoh emission being an interference it's an interference because why you only want to measure barium yet you are now measuring the emission of something else of some something which is a uh, is categorized as a 
band spectra. So here in this case, band spectra that you want to get rid of. Somehow you must get rid of it. Okay, it's considered an interference. So molecular bands which overlap your atomic lines are considered interference. Or it could be continuum. Continuum spectra is even worse. You know, it's due to maybe you have some particulate matter in your uh, flame which gives out a continuum radiation. What is continuum compared to band? From the name, continuum is even worse. That means you have here, you have radiation all the way high up here. So if you were to draw the spectrum for continuum, it would be up here. Okay? Over a wider range of wavelengths compared to the band. Band is quite limited. Atom is even more limited. But there's continuum spectra, that means it's another problem. At every wavelength, you get interference from this continuum spectra. So these are the two things that you want to get rid of if they are consider if they are interference to your atomic emission or your atomic radiation of interest. Um, just this last thing, this is just an, an intro before we get into atom absorption actually. We talk about atomization. How do you change things to atoms? Huh? So from your, you have your sample in solution, but yet in order for it to absorb the light from your source, remember your instrument, you have your source, your wavelength selector, your detector. But your sample is a solution. How do you convert your, uh, for example, just now we talk about your uh, uh, solution of NaCl. If we are interested in measuring the uh, absorption of sodium, we need to convert that sodium ion in solution to a sodium atom before, and it must be in a gaseous form, okay? An atom in a gaseous form before it can absorb that light from the source. So the process of um, atomization requires you to now introduce your sample, not introduce your friend to somebody else, but to, you now talk about, not introduce A to B, but you now introduce, you introduce, you put your sample into, the, into, your, into your particular equipment. How do you want to introduce your sample? Okay, so you talk about sample introduction. How you want to get your sample? into the system so that ultimately it can be changed to a vapor so i mean all these things will you'll be looking at it again various kinds of atomizer like we mentioned just now whether you have a flame an actual flame like a bunsen burner but it's better than a bunsen burner okay bunsen burner is noisy noisy the flame is like a candle flame okay unstable you we now need to use a more stable flame Electrothermal using um, electrical energy and we talk about ICP where you talk about now using um, radio frequency, couple, couple radio frequency so that you get, your, uh, you get your atomizer and the various kinds of things. And we see here, for your solution to become a vapor, surely it needs some energy, right? That solution must vaporize turn into something ultimately then only then only you get your sodium atoms in a vapor so of course all these atomizers must be at a certain temperature and we see varying temperatures here the flame so you know when you're doing AAS you no know, putting your hands into whatever or touching the burner and whatnot I mean this are you don't want to have a very bad burn okay you're talking about high energy high temperatures And when we talk about sample introduction, how we want to introduce our sample into the system, you talk about different kinds of nebulization or uh, hydride generation and whatnot, you know. Um, the simplest that we will... So what we, what we have is your now the, the, the process, you have your sample of interest in solution. Sodium plus sodium ions uh, floating around in that beaker of solution okay? but we want it to form sodium atoms here in the flame so the process from the solution to the flame usually involves some nebulizer who has asthmatic problems 
who has or who has had to use a nebulizer? Nobody. Okay. Maybe your brothers, your sisters, your uncles, or whatever. No, nobody. Where or sometimes uh, when you go to a maybe uh, maybe some Korean drama that you watch, you know, in the hospital where they want higher humidity, you have this nebulizer, you know, vapor. Or maybe you've gone to hospital here where they have a, like a nebulizer to so that the, is the, the room is not so dry, okay? So you have a vapor coming out of that nebulizer. So similarly here, you have some, a nebulizer too, where you have solution becoming vapor, okay? So your sample will be introduced into the nebulizer, which will then form a vapor, aerosol, small droplets of the solution. And then this will be then introduced into the flame, which ultimately will have to uh, what is shown the processes here okay solution nebulization becomes an aerosol tiny tiny droplets of water or of solution containing your each droplet may contain your will contain your na plus cl minus etc etc whatever is in your sample which will have to undergo dissolvation in other words which will you will have to in, uh, understand it comes from solvent solvent is you put something to dissolve something okay now desolvation means you get rid of the solvent so you get rid of the solvent the water and it becomes some dry aerosol your NaCl particles this will then have to go under volatilization to become a vapor to become molecular vapor and ultimately to become gaseous atoms it's only these atoms which then will the electron will be jumping from here to there okay Nothing here will do any jumping. No electron here will be doing any jumping. But if you, this is what, if you talk about atomic absorption, atomic emission, this has to happen. You must get your uh, atoms formed. So, usually it's these processes that go, that you'll go through. And just to show you, okay, this nebulizer, we will look at it again. I didn't bring a, f a physical one next, next time. I'll bring one. When you talk about nebulizer, you have your sample solution you must have some high pressure uh, gas flowing so you have a central tube and then you have an outer tube through which this high pressure gas will flow so you form some low pressure region here which will then make the atmospheric pressure push on the you have your container here push on the sample and the sample will again go through here and as it goes through that low pressure region you get your aerosol being formed so most of the nebulizers used are based on this and then you have your other stories which we will look at much later anyway so any questions with that intro basically we've gone through that all those things before all those uh, energy le level diagrams etc etc so now we start with our first technique atomic absorption spectrometry uh, be very familiar with this uh, acronym AAS Atomic Absorption spe Spectrometry Spectroscopy Okay Maybe you should go and look up What's the difference between the two Or sometimes we can use it synonymously Okay uh, Interchangeably Spectroscopy and Spectrometry Although some books Some people might be more particular uh, In the usage of the word What is it used for? Basically trace metals uh, you're talking about detection of uh, metals at ppm levels ppb and you um, basically that's that's about it i suppose if you want your parts per trillion you have to go to another technique you basically PB, ppm ppb have you all revised your how to convert from one unit to the other be very familiar okay what PPM levels are, what PPB levels. We're not going to do any revision of that. Okay, now the in doing these techniques, we will look again. What are the what is it, what is the basic principle of that technique? What is the instrumentation used? What are the applications? Because you want to know now um, the calculations involved. You know what kind of data do you get from such an, a technique? So. All the techniques that we are going to be discussing from now on will be based on that. Mention a specific technique, you know the basic principles. What happens? What is the theory, theory behind it? Okay. Then, instrument. You must understand the instrument. 
because if something goes wrong it goes back to you know something related to the instrument so you must have an understanding of the basic components in the instrument how it works and then of course ultimately application so for any technique those are the three things that we you have to cover so from the name atomic absorption what do we want to measure here the absorption of the atomic species so remember for absorption it must have a source wavelength selector detector those must not be forgotten and then now we want to know for AS how do we introduce our sample okay not in a cuvette as you have done as some some of you have done for your UV vis absorption okay nothing in a cuvette here it's going to be a flame or electrical means and of course you have your readout so th this is a uh, basic the basic components uh, of what an instrument that we use in AS which is a single beam and we will look at double beam uh, further along the line as mentioned just now atomization in atomic absorption we must get the atoms how are we going to get the atoms either you use a flame or you use electrothermal we will start out with flame uh, uh, atomization like we said just now sample in solution needs to be changed to uh, an aerosol fine spray of droplets undergo desalvation volatilization okay so now ultimately in your flame you will get not only your atoms you will get some molecules some ions if the the like for example the sodium atom is an alkali metal the ionization energy is very low so probably in a certain flame you are going to get some atoms forming the atom uh, sorry ions atoms will become ions for low for uh, alkali metals for example low ionization energy let's say your sample was from the sea next to the bridge and then you put it inside your you introduce into your your AS instrument okay so sea water has a lot of sodium chloride you what you're gonna see if you have a solution uh, uh, a concentrated solution of sodium chloride you put it into your AAS in the flame you're going to see uh, sparkling you know this sodium <coughs> these particles because there's so much salt it uh, it did not get uh, vaporized too much of it okay so some of these particles are still in in particulate form and so they will scatter the light so you get like they are dispersing the light so you get some some sparks in the flame okay due to this particulate matter which did not volatilize okay so you will have all these kind of species i mean it's not ideally everything becomes atoms no you have atoms molecules ions a mixture in your flame showing what the processes involved in atomic absorption okay you have your analyte sample your solution undergoing through nebulization through your nebulizer becoming uh, droplets fine droplets which are not all of the same size through any nebulization process we are going to get droplets of various sizes some small some big okay you have a distribution of particle sizes and let me let me tell you here that only the fine droplets will go up the bigger droplets will have has anybody done the aa not yet you have a bottle a plastic bottle on the floor and as you do your experiment you will see that that bottle keeps filling up with waste solution where did that waste solution come from for every let's say five mils that you put into that you introduce into your instrument perhaps maybe um, 80 percent goes into that drain only about 20 percent will actually go up into the flame because as i said drop droplets form are they have a distribution of sizes only the small ones which are lighter will find will go up you don't want the big ones to go into the flame anyway okay so it goes into the drain uh, those that make up into the flame will that make it up into the into the flame will then undergo dissolvation evaporation volatilization etc etc which becomes molecules molecules dissociate into atoms so all these terms please use them correctly okay molecular species will dissociate to become atoms and 
atom, some of the atoms, if the energy in the flame is enough to ionize it, it will ionize. If it's not enough, it won't form ions. Okay, so this is the process. Now you have the process on the side where molecules, for example, just now we have shown CaOH has that band spectrum, can also become excited and have its own uh, atomic, uh, sorry, its molecular absorption or molecular emission. The atoms also can become excited atoms and have their atomic lines. The ions, if the energy in the flame is enough, can also have ionic lines. Because we show just we, we have seen the energy level diagram for the Mg plus, right? So it can also become excited, the electron can become excited, etc. etc. So you have a rather complicated uh, thing coming out from your flame okay you can have your molecular emission molecular atomic emission or your ionic emission that's why you need to have your wavelength selector to only so that you see only what you are interested in and nothing else because there's so man, many things going on okay last thing that we want to mention is we talk about the flame atomizer the function of the flame is to change those aerosol droplets finally to the at atomic species. Many kinds of flames use the natural gas. Uh, you can have... So in a flame, there are two things that you need. You need the fuel and you need the oxygen. So it's ultimately, it's, you know, it's, like I said, some hydrocarbon plus oxygen becoming... So if you have complete combustion, it will become CO2 plus water. Okay? Oh, oh. And you see the various combinations having different temperatures. The most common one that we will use will be the one that we always use is where the fuel is acetylene, C2H2, and air. Of course, C2H2 will, uh, will be oxidized by the oxygen in the air. Okay? And the temperatures are 2000 over degree centigrade for some elements this energy is not enough to atomize it it's not enough to excite it okay you need to use a higher temperature flame and we use the acetylene nitrous oxide but you have to be more cautious when you use the acetylene nitrous oxide why do why are people scared with this AS is because if you don't follow the proper procedure to light up the flame or to shut it down uh, some dangerous explosion can occur okay so like any other thing okay when you cross the road you're supposed to look left and right if not you're going to get knocked down by somebody similarly here when you do your AAS anything you must you have proper procedure you follow the procedure okay so that things do not happen but of course uh, you know, nowadays with uh, the sophisticated equipment nowadays compared to what I had to use when I was a student or when I was doing my PhD, there are safety measures where, you know, explosions, the, the probability of explosions, uh, explosions occurring will be minimized. So you don't have to be scared, I suppose. Unless you are, that, that's what I said, unless you are too, uh, you don't want to follow procedure at all, okay? the proper procedure you know you do things all the wrong way so then then you might have some accident but now you have so many safety precautions that such things will not happen okay so okay that's with that we continue with on Wednesday hopefully